Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of the Battlestar Galactica franchise documentary. I'm delighted to be joined by Tom O'Pinnick uh, to talk about his role as Halo in Battlestar Galactica. Um, Tomo, I suppose it's nearly been a, a decade now since Battlestar Galactica has been on our our TV screens and from the time, for well, it's reruns and such, but in terms of the time you've been filming us and, on this, uh, and a day on set, does it almost feel like a decade? Does it feel longer or does it feel like yesterday is sometimes uh, do you start to reminisce about it and you think, yeah, all oh, only feels like months ago or does it feel like two or three lifetimes ago now at this stage? You know, it, it changes at times. The thing is that I'm sure you've heard this from the other cast that you interviewed. Um, there's a large contingency of, of the gang is in LA and it's just a testament to how close everyone is. You know, most of the life events, birthdays, parties, celebrations, even weekly meals are done with each other's families. Everyone still hangs out a lot. We're very close. We're kind of, uh, we're bonded for life. I'm, uh, I'm often in BC, uh, being the Canadian that I am, and I've been spending less and less time in LA over the years. Uh, so I, I don't get to see a, the majority of the cast as much as I would like to. Um, but when you're with them, it feels recent. It feels it feels like it wasn't that long ago, but I think we're all getting to the point where we realize it's been a long time. The, the industry and our fans um, don't let us forget the show though. It's not that we ever would, but it's, 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 it's almost had like this renaissance in the last three years. And I think that really has to do with, you know, um, just how relevant the show is still today and everything that's been happening across the planet, geopolitically, uh, you know, the rise of populism, you know, having presidents like Donald Trump in power, you know, somehow the show is more relevant than it ever was. And, you know, Eddie was one of the few people who, who called that long, long before anybody else. He always said the show's going to be talked about 20 years from now. So we've still got years to go where the show is going to be discussed and spoken about. I'm always surprised on Twitter when somebody else is like, listen, Time Magazine just rated you again, one of the best shows or this critical, uh, you know, uh, um, newsprint or uh, magazine or online forum rated you guys as, uh, you know, again, one of the best shows that's ever been done. Um uh, the, the accolades that we're still receiving this many years after the show being done is fascinating to me. Um, uh, but humbly, I'm, I'm just, I'm always so touched. And uh, I, 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 I don't look forward to the day where, when it's not talked about anymore. You know what I mean? I think that's how proud I am and most of us are of the show. It has been some time though. You know, a lot of people have had a, a lot has transpired since we did the show. You know, a lot of things have changed. The kids have grown up. Some uh, new ones have been added to the greater family. You know, there's been, uh, there's been some unions, there's been some breakups. There's a lot has transpired in, in those uh, 10, 12 years that it's been since we did the show. And I suppose, uh, Tom, one thing that sort of struck me was about the show is that when they started off, there was a blend of, say, really established actors and really sort of young sort of actors as well. Their sort of their first gig for a few of them, a few of them, their first real sort of TV series as such, a real sort of some of them walked into it not knowing whether it be a one season gig, a 10 season episode or a long it, what it turned out to be four seasons. You had probably the established cast there of uh, Mary uh, McDonald, Paul Hogan, um, Eddie Olmos, James Callis, and maybe Trisha Helfer to a lesser extent, but still very popular renowned. And then the rest of you were all sort of young guns, sort of young budding sort of actors trying to find your way. So was it the sort really? of, did you, did, did you sort of younger cast, did you rely on each other to sort of that first season? Or did you always have that guidance of the older sort of figures to look, to look down on you and to sort of pull you through? Well, I'll tell you, uh, we couldn't have been more blessed to have Eddie and Mary being the parents that they are, the grandparents that they are, uh, in Eddie's case, as uh, the two leads of the show, because they they both have just such a maternal, paternal instinct in them. And fortunately, they're not like so many people who have been in the business for as many years as them and become jaded and angry. And, you know, a lot of people, this business can be very hard on them. And and those people were two of the most generous um um, leads you could ever ask for. They were they were so giving um, in 
in their knowledge, in their wisdom, and how they conducted themselves on set. That was the most important thing. Mm. For many of us who were young, and maybe we'd had, most of us had some done some work, but nobody had, the young cast that you're referring to, none of us had done a significant television series or you know anything big that really gave us enough experience in the business to know how to how to uh, how to deal with this this big new show and, and its its potential and its longevity. But Eddie and Mary just they were constantly guiding us. They they knew and recognized in us where we were in our in our career. You know how young we were, the nerves we had, um, the anxiety involved. And I can tell you many different times where I was staring at one of my idols. Like I I grew up watching Eddie almost on television, uh, like in movies. I still remember Blade Runner as being one of the most significant movies of my youth. I was very young, but that movie blew me away. I was fascinated by it. And I remember asking my dad about that actor. I'm like, but what about that guy, that guy? Because his performances, after that, I was a lifelong fan. So you gotta understand when I walked on to the show and I realized that he was the lead, sometimes I'll be staring at him and he'd be talking to me and he, he just, he, Eddie's the coolest cat, man. He's like, yeah, dude, and don't worry. And the scene's about this. And he's just such a laid back old, you know, sixties rocker. Like Eddie's had real storied career, but he would, he'd be talking to me all casually. And so, so affably, but then I'd have a moment and I'd be like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm staring at Eddie almost like, I, yeah. You'd freeze up. You'd have moments where you'd just be overcome with anxiety and fear, like, holy shit. And he would just calm you down and he would talk to you and they'd give you pep talks. Um, I always remember, um, again, like that kid, those, the older actors in the show were propping us up whenever we were doubting ourselves. But because the material was so good, it allowed most of us to, to deliver. Mm. If they weren't those actors and they left us behind and they didn't guide us, they didn't make us feel welcome and confident in our craft and that we were doing a good job, many of us wouldn't have stepped up to the plate. We wouldn't have gotten done what we needed to do because it's terrifying to be acting with an actor who's been doing it for 40 years professionally, who has an Academy Award nomination, who's got tons of critical acclaim and accolades and expressive experience. It can be very intimidating to act with that. But these guys were so generous. You know, Michael Hogan was the exact same way. Michael can be really terrifying if you don't know him because he's just kind of like this hard ass, good old Canadian boy. He's a legend in Canadian uh, cinema and radio and theater. Him and Susan are old school from Shaw, Stratford, thespians. They're classically trained. The body of work that the two of them, him and his wife had done is astounding. But if, if you haven't clicked with Michael, if you haven't really gotten to know him, he can be quite intimidating. And he's a, he's a really consummate actor who gets into his roles and stays in his character. So when he's playing Colonel Ty, he's into Colonel Ty mode. And it can be intimidating. And I remember one time where I thought I was doing the work and I felt good about it, but just the young actor in me was doubting a lot of uh, things. And just in my head, spending too much time second guessing a performance or a scene that I'd done. And I'll never forget Michael coming up to me. And, and um, I think I was actually walking by him and he was in the trailers and he's sitting there just having a smoke outside his trailer. And he, he was like, hey, Tomo, uh, that uh, performance you did uh, and that scene, you know, this and this episode, he goes, mm. it was really beautiful work. It was very truthful. I just, great work, man. You're doing a great job. And that's all he said. And fuck, did it mean a lot to me? Excuse my language. It meant yep. so much to me. Um, you know, as a young actor, it's those, it's those little things of encouragement that we need to make us remember and recognize that we are doing the job. And again, you know, I know I said it three times, but the older actors on this show really, um, they really took us under their wing and made sure that we knew we were doing a good job and that we had a lot of potential and that we would only get better. And if you watch the performances of the actors, the young actors, I find that we're doing, the work that we were doing in first season compared to third season is much more nuanced and much more uh, uh, um, uh, experienced and uh, you can see the growth. And I suppose, uh, Tom, uh, one thing that uh, sort of struck me uh, from doing this sort of documentary so far is in terms of the casting audition and the revealing that's coming out in terms of characters actually who've actually uh, went went for different roles in Battlestar Galactica yeah, didn't yeah, yeah, actually get actually didn't get them and actually we got uh, got on to other sort of roles. So uh, actually, Grace Park actually told me she tried out for a star book actually didn't get that and actually wound up with Boomer. Aaron Douglas has taught me that he told he tried out for Apollo. He didn't get that and vice and then he tried out for um the role of Gator and he didn't get that. And by somehow chance then 
he got the role of um, chief. And then I suppose it's 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 sort of Candice McClure then was saying that basically that her audition came by an absolute chance of one hit in a million uh, terms. How was it? How was the story for you, Tomo? Did you to just try out for the role as Halo? Did you try out for previous roles, or was it by flute? Was it by coincidence or some story that you got your role? Yeah, there's really the, the, really what happened is I got the audition from my agent. Um, and I just started working professionally for a few years before that. So uh, things were happening for me, but there were still smaller supporting roles, a few guest stars here and there. So I was still relatively green. Um, and uh, I got the audition from my agent and I remember seeing the title right away. And I was like, oh, this, this has got to be a remake because I remember the original show. Um, again, I was very, very young, but I remember it. And uh, I got the audition and I looked at the sides and the sides were incredible. And it was the scene Specifically, it was the scene where Hilo gives up his seat on the planet. He knows he's wounded. In the sides that I could see, the writing that I could see, I made the choice that Hilo was mortally wounded. Like, he didn't think he was going to make it. But he didn't want to show that to Sharon, to Boomer. He didn't want her to let, let her know. He, and he said, listen, um, I'm going to stay here. We're going to... Humanity is about to be destroyed here. Mm. I'm going to give up my seat to our planet's genius because... We're talking about the future of humanity here, and I feel like he's going to better serve it than I will. It's a very heroic thing. It gives you a real sense of who this guy was. When I read those seeds, the sides, I instantly connected to them, and I thought it was one of the rare times. And again, I was a young actor, but I'd never had an audition at that point where I just, I read it, and I I wasn't overcome with anxiety or the fear, the, the nervousness we get of big jitters of something that's exciting and new. I was just, I was overcome with the most unique feeling that I've ever had. Mm in my 20 years of professional career, which was, I just, I couldn't wait to get in the room. And I just understood him. I'm like, I know who this guy is. It's right here on the page, who this man is. He's an upstanding, heroic, ethical, moral human being of, of the highest degree. And uh, I know this guy and I can't wait to do it. So when I went in for the audition, uh, I was very prepared. And uh, I still remember a lot, a lot of people were, were you know, a lot of the actors that I recognize and I see at auditions all the time were there and in the hallway and it was too busy uh, outside of the uh, the casting room. So I went outside the hallway and I was sitting by myself and just kind of preparing my own way. <clears throat> but I was in it. I was already there. And, and uh, I remember this man walked by and he kind of had like long flowing, you know, uh, uh, silver fox hair and glasses and just very chilled down. I, I remember having a moment because I was just in my zone and he stopped. He actually stopped and he just looked at me and I looked at him and I smiled because I didn't know who he was, but he could have been the director and it was part of my brain that was thinking that, but I didn't make any effort to, you know, because I was just in my headspace and he gave me my smile. He said, hey, and I was like, oh, hi. And then he went in and then sure enough, it was the director. It was Michael Reimer. And uh, I did my read and it went really well. And he was like, okay, great. I like the choice you're making. Let's try this. And he gave me a small adjustment. And I did that and we did the scene again and then that was it. And I felt really good about the audition. Uh, I knew I did my work, um, but I didn't hear about it for eight days. I didn't hear a peep. So I thought I didn't get the role, um, which wasn't devastating to me because it was one of those times, even as a young actor, where I knew that I did good work and I left it alone. And then my agent called me and she said, you've got the role, you've got the role. I had no idea uh, that it was a miniseries. I didn't actually know that. I thought it was, I thought it was a one-off I didn't know if it was going to be a series. Like, I didn't really know the details. And I definitely didn't know that Eddie and Mary were involved. Um, okay. Which gave it a whole different level of, 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 of legitimacy, of, of, of weight. Like, two heavyweights like that, two Academy Award nominees are going to be the leads. My God, when I found that out, I was ecstatic. I was over the moon, my friend. Uh, I suppose, uh, Tomo, one thing that's probably a daring choice by the directors and the Ron Moore well, and probably caused an awful lot of stir at the start in terms of the Battlestar Galactica was obviously, uh, as we know, the original Battlestar Galactica, the Dirk Benedict uh, face man from the A-team, he played Starbuck. Mm -hmm. At this time, uh, Ron Moore and the directors decided they were going to put a female lead as Starbuck, change Starbuck to a female character. It caused... Um, mixed reaction at first but oh my god then Katie Sackhoff she absolutely 
demolished the role and obviously yeah, it it, 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 be, it became uh she became an absolute star of the show the sort of guiding light and she's gone on to huge things but uh, it, that was probably a brave decision by directors at the time, a sort of bold one, but uh, it, it could have gone both ways. But I suppose Katie Sackhoff was probably just made for that role. 100%. I mean, look, at the show The show was really breaking barriers in a lot of ways. And unfortunately, you know, we're seeing more of it finally, but sci-fi often seems to be the place where it's happening. Look at, look at how bold and risque Star Trek was in the 60s. You had you had a uh, a very diverse multi ethnic class uh, a cast there which had never been done before you know um, it imagined a future for humanity that was much more equal and diverse and accepting and and tolerant and Battlestar in terms of cable and streaming television it was one of the first shows, shows to really set a precedent again in that aspect and I think that was a strong choice Katie knocked that role out of the effing park man she nailed it. She was so good and she got better. She got better. And that's why Katie works as much as she does. And that's why she's still doing the incredible roles that she does because she's deserving of that. She's such a talented actor. But you know, everyone was great. Grace, Grace, Grace did a fantastic job playing multiple versions of eight. You know, Trisha knocked it out of the park. Our females uh, uh, cast was just exceptional. They were fantastic. So many of the actors on this show just carved out their own thing. Come on, James Callis, Gaius Baltar, that's a character. If you've ever never, if you've ever seen the show, you'll never forget that character. James has this incredible intelligence of being able to do a heavily dramatic role and just always find some humor in it. <laughs> he can just slip in humor in a place where you would never imagine it. Um, yeah, Eddie, Mary, I could go on and on. Every one of my cast members, I'm so proud of them, the work they did. Uh, could you imagine anyone else? Like you were talking about uh, Aaron Douglas going out for a different role. Could you ever imagine yeah, I... Jamie Bamber playing the chief or even me? Like that was Douglas through and through. He owned that role. That role was written for him. There was a higher power that was involved casting us in these roles, man, because it was perfect. I suppose, uh, Tom o uh, one thing about your sort of character, Halo, he almost feels like the Captain America sort of fighting on the ground, the sort of star trooper sort of role, sort of leading into sort of a battle. He's, we, we see him uh, most of the time on, on this sort of planet, sort of, uh, sort of a resistance type sort of sort, type of fighter, uh, sort of one man sort of bands trying to take down the sort of enemy as such. And that. Uh, <laughs> In, in terms of that, did you get a sort of enjoyment about that sort of rogue sort of nature of that character? Absolutely. I loved I loved all of it. But you have to understand, my friend, too, it, it was challenging at times because we all were very invested in our characters and the journeys. Like, we, we couldn't wait to get our hands on the next script. We were always wondering what's going to happen. We all knew that we were expendable. People could die. Actors could, our characters could be killed off in a second. Uh, you know, we get in arguments sometimes. Jamie Bamber and I would, we'd be busting each other's balls on set all the time about the decisions our characters had made. You know, we'd be arguing about the the the, the merits of it. You know, the the it, 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 we'd get into it, and and oftentimes Hilo was alone. He felt very alone. He was uh, alienated by the rest of the the uh, the crew. So there were times in the you know in the second season when I came back, but like even as the actor, like I Tomo felt like separate from them. But that's because we were so into our characters, and, and you have to believe in your your character and their journey. You have to find the purpose and the reality of it. And if the reality is you you are fighting a, a lone battle, you know it's it was Hilo and 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 his wife and his and his child. And at, at times, even though he, he what was so powerful about the characters, he knew the difference between right, right and wrong. He was the moral compass of the show. That didn't make it easy. And that conflict and that struggle, I hope came through in the, um, in the performances because you definitely felt that even as the actor playing those roles. Uh, Tomo, uh, one thing that sort of struck me having watched the, the series as such is the, the command unit, the, IC, the ICU sort of unit. Your character, I don't know if this is true or not, but I don't actually recall your character ever being in that sort of particular part of the state, it's always seemed to be offshore or in the 
in the carrier sort of area as such. So yeah, I remember speaking to Michael uh, Trucio and he taught me his first and Candice McClure their their first days on set because the the uh, there were so many different corridors attached to ICU and so many it was like a big sort of hangar space hangar sort of space that they actually got lost uh, trying oh. to get their way around because it was so huge. But a bit of tint, because you were, most of your sh shooting was probably in offset sort of locations, outside locations. Did you ever have that sort of problem or do you have any memories going around that sort of ICU set? Or? I was probably more lost than anybody because all of them, with the exception of Grace and Trisha, who kind of joined us a little bit in first season, a few of the actors did, but like I was the one running around the planet on the first the first season and the, the miniseries. And so when I got to the ICU and started shooting with everyone and they brought Kilo back to the Galactica, I was lost many, many times. I think it was, I was lost way, way past the time where it was still excusable. You know, the ADs would be like, Tomo, that door, through this door, studio four, there it is. Go straight, take a right. You'd be, you'd be wandering the hallways there sometimes. You'd have to just follow people's voices. It was, but that was that was that was the cool thing about it, man. As an actor, you know, when they bring these sets to life that are that are, you know, so fantastic, like as good as ours were, it really just helps you feel like the claustrophobia, the the anxiety of being stuck in a ship with no, you know like a metal ship in space running for your life. Like you can believe in the circumstances and the story that you're trying to tell a lot easier than say if it wasn't, say if there was no roof and it was just totally exposed, you know? They did such a good job on the sets that it really, really helped us believe in the circumstances. I, I always remember uh, in third season, we did the, um, there was a, a little offshoot. There was kind of like a little arc called the, uh, where we did it on the Demetrius. It was like a sewage recycling ship and me and Katie and Michael Truco and, and um, Alessandro and, uh, and um, uh, there was a bunch of us. There was a bunch of us there. Uh, we went off into this little side story and man, they did such an incredible job with that ship. And we were shooting in the middle of summer in Vancouver and it happened to be a sweltering hot summer. So we were sweating our asses off in there. And that was part of this, the, the ship too. It was supposed to be very sweaty and hot. And we were doing these long scenes and these long days filming in there and people were getting exhausted and irritable. And it was perfect because it was, that's exactly what was happening with this ship, you know? And, uh, oh yeah, I've just got so many great memories of that experience. And uh, I suppose, uh, Tomo, uh, one thing about a sort of Battlestar Galactica was the storylines and the scripts. And you mentioned no one knew what was going to happen from episode to episode. And they touched on so many serious issues uh, in terms of what happened in terms of real life, from alcoholism to drugs um, to sex uh, to depression to suicide. We actually had a character, a Candace McClure's character, uh, Douala, actually... A sort of grim storyline actually took her own life and um, yeah. she thought all hope was sort of lost so it's sort of real sort of dark sort of content as well that sort of shows the i suppose humanity's flaws in, as such so it wasn't the case of just hop into these pilot jets and go out and shoot uh, robots uh, in terms of and ha kill a few robots happy days and then next week have another air battle again it was battlestar galactica wasn't really that sort of a shoot them up arcade sort of airplane uh, simulator game at all, really, this TV series. It touched on an awful lot of morale issues as well. Absolutely. And that's why the show's still being talked about this many years after the fact. If we were just another show that was doing the same thing uh, in that same sort of rigid, cliche scientific mold that had been done a million times before we wouldn't we wouldn't have stood out you wouldn't be talking you and i wouldn't be having this discussion right now it's that's been done many 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 times the show was so much deeper on so many different levels and was discussing such serious serious issues as as, as the world was dealing with at the time you know presidents guided by god and stem cell issues and in in, in, in intolerance and racism and bigotry and and, and uh, opposing sides and tribalism um, suicide bombers, uh, you know, religion, all these things. That's why the show is being talked about right now, because of these things are at the forefront of humanity right now across the globe. Everyone's discussing these things. We're trying to find our way in this, this, this mess of a new world that we're living in this brave new world with the, we're all inundated with 
misinformation and disinformation. It's like nobody even knows what they can rely on and, and everybody's going into camps and we're, we're regressing from all the work, uh, all the sacrifice that was done during the Second World War when our grandparents were fighting fascism and, and these very things that this show dealt with. And it feels like we're really regressing in the world and it's terrifying for a lot of people. And again, that's why the show is being talked about again so much right now, because everything that's happening, this rise of populism across the world, like how it's, how it's become acceptable and okay to, you know, to, 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 to be intolerant, to, 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 to be openly racist and a bigot. It's, it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying what's happening right now. So in that aspect, I'm, I'm happy that the, the show is, is, um, is, uh, is forcing conversations and allowing for discourse again. But I almost feel like as, as terrifying as 2004 was, 2005, when the United States and the Allied forces went to war over in Iraq and Afghanistan, that was, those were scary times. But I feel like these are much scarier. I feel like these are much scarier. There's been a progression. There's been a regression um, in terms of uh, uh, humanity and, and, and uh, uh, people getting along and communicating and working towards... Uh, desired goals uh, and essential things that we need to do, like uh, get, get, get the environment in check. We're, we're destroying this planet. Um, I don't know, it's, it's fascinating to think that we have technology that allows us to speak on, to anyone across the planet in real time, in a second, at any time through text, via social media, you can get huge audiences. And yet we're at a point where there's Nobody's talking to each other anymore. Nobody's listening. It's just everybody's screaming their own hatred. And this is my side and this is your side. And there's more division happening right now than I've, I've seen in, in my adult life. And uh, I really hope we can get over it. I and that's that why art like is so important to keep going. And to, we need art like this to, 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 to continue the conversation. I suppose, uh, Tomo, uh, one thing that sort of struck me, struck me from talking about you is your investment in the character, and you seem to be a real sort of a real sort of fan of, of the show now. But even then, when you were shooting, you seemed to be engripped in the sort of storylines. Where, as a cast, when that table read that script came out each week, were you were you fascinated to find out what was happening to? other ca actors and actresses characters what was happening in the storyline was a sort of uh, a jaw dropping or was there a good lot of jaw dropping moments when you found out what was happening to different sort of cast members and say oh I, I i i can't actually wait to see what that looks like or how that's going to play out was there an awful sense of oohs and ahs every time you got the script each week not also also for your own character but for other characters as well yeah, and, you know, me in particular, I was I was often worried about being killed too. I wasn't doing, you know, I wasn't doing Jamie Bamber's character. I wasn't doing Apollo any favors. I wasn't doing, I was, uh, you know, originally I was a, a character that was supposed to be killed in the miniseries. They didn't have plans for Hilo beyond that. But apparently they saw opportunity for a different storyline to continue. And I'm so grateful that they did. And Grace and I were able to do some incredible work together over that uh, five, six year period. Um, but, you know, we'd, we'd always, every one of us with bated breath would be waiting for that new script. We were all incredible fans of the show, but we were also genuinely worried about one of us being written off the show. And then you'd see these wonderful arcs in the episodes or something incredible would happen with one of the char characters or there'd be a reveal of a Cylon or another twist that, you know, our amazing writers would do. And uh, we were always invested and excited about that. And the read-throughs were, they were good, man. You know, I, I think, uh, yeah, I'd love to go back and do a read-through with the cast. You know, I, uh, a bunch of them got together with uh, Trisha's podcast and they did that in LA and I was actually supposed to be there for that. And uh, I think things started to happen with COVID right around there. Either that or I was working in Vancouver and I couldn't fly down, but I planned on being there for that read-through. Um, and uh, I was a little heartbroken that I couldn't be. It, it would have been a cool experience to sit around with my gang and just read an episode of Battlestar again. Um, yeah, but we always look forward to those, man. I, I suppose, uh, Tomo, uh, one thing before I, I, I start to, the second last question, the penultimate uh, sort of question I'll put towards you. One thing that Eddie Olmos uh, told me uh, in terms of the thing that when he signed on for Battlestar uh, Galactica, he made it in writing in terms of his contract that if any sort of aliens appeared on the show that he was off, basically. If any sort of tree-headed monsters, any sort of thing, that he could take the one enemy 
uh, being the sort of the human engineered enemy. But if they went into any other sort of different alternate uh, worlds or atmospheres or sort of sci-fi, which is common with normal sci-fi shows, like even great sci-fi shows like uh, Stargate, uh, which is done by Richard Dean Anderson and huge success, a massive sci-fi show. And that was popular. But Eddie had written into his contract anything along that sort of lines or delved that he was gone. And obviously it was a daring sort of choice at the time, but very successful uh, in terms of, it's just the constant, the one sort of battle the whole time in terms of preserving humanity, the one sort of enemy, the one concept. So there's no real sort of uh, head scratching as such to it. Yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I remember hearing that about Eddie. I, I think I found that out years ago. Um, years after we filmed, I don't think Eddie shared that with me. I think uh, I think someone in the press brought that up, or it was, it was spoken about on the panel. I get it. I think Eddie again. You know, at least Eddie had accomplished so much in his career already up to that point. You know, he was he directed a, an incredible movie in his early forties, produced it, directed, acted in it, uh, and uh, American Me and. Um, and uh, he had the knowledge and the ex and the the, the 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 discerning wisdom to be able to see the long term potential and the power of Battlestar Galactica. So I can only imagine the conversation when they signed him on. Like he he must have read the pilot, and then I would imagine that there was a creative with him and David Icke and Ron Moore where they fleshed out what they saw in the series. Like you know, they gave him, they pitched it to Eddie. When you're an actor of that level and you're wanting to bring him on as a lead, you're really going to have to sell him on it. So they must have sold him well and they must have assured him that none of that was going to be in there because he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't interested in that. And, and, and the, the, the bones of the show, the bones of what the, they were trying to do with the series is what must have grabbed him. And he, he felt like he could sign on because it's not like Eddie had done any other sci-fi um, since that show, since one of the most incredible and iconic sci-fi films ever done, which is Blade Runner. So for him to sign on to Battlestar Galactica, it had to be legit. And I suppose, uh, Tom Mo, the sort of last question now before I let you go, and probably the hardest question I'm going to ask you, uh, Aaron had to think a while before answering this, but uh, in terms of this one now, uh, if, if there was a sort of, say, uh, Battlestar Galactica dictionary, and they put your character halo into that dictionary and they left two blank sentences underneath and they asked you Tam O'Pennicott having portrayed the character halo to write those two sentences what would you like those two sentences to read mm. tough one I know <laughs> I mean you know I, I don't know what I'd like them to read I mean the obvious thing was you know Hilo wanted anything to be said about him is that he always strived to do the right thing and he couldn't do the wrong thing. And he was a loving father and husband and uh, he was an incredibly uh, uh, loyal and um, honorable and brave soldier. Also, he believed, he believed in the, um, he believed in the service he believed in uh, the uh, the potential of it. Uh, on that note, uh, Tom O'Pennicott, an absolute pleasure, Tom O'Pennicott, an absolute pleasure talking to you uh, today to relive your memories as Halo in Battlestar Galactica. Uh, so such a prominent role throughout the series and no doubt in the future, uh, if there's ever a remake or a retake of the Battlestar Galactica or a one-off sort of movie, I know they've touched nearly all the bases that they can be touched, but no doubt uh, we could see your role uh, uh, occurring again and your portrayal of that character and uh, please God uh, but for the moment uh, Tomo uh, in these troublesome times uh, stay safe to you and your loved ones uh, take care to you my friend be well and stay safe thank you so much for the interview thank you